Well, thank you all for attending. I'll uh, propose that we start now and stragglers can fill in as they arrive. Um, my name is Neil Jock. I'm the host with my colleague from the History Department, Daniel Sargent, in um, presenting this series on U.S. foreign policy. And it's a real pleasure today to have um, uh, a former colleague of mine when I worked at the State Department in the policy planning staff um, and uh, a friend who I've uh, been to Bob Dylan concerts with and uh, discussed boxing matches because his wife is a journalist who once got to cover a boxing match that I wished I had been able to go to, but um, I'm not a journalist. In any case, uh, Robert Deneen is the uh, Eni Enrico Matei Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He headed the Jerusalem mission of the quartet, Representative Tony Blair, from April 2008 until August 2010. A former career State Department official with over 20 years of Middle East experience. He previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs with responsibilities for Israeli-Palestinian issues, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt. He also served at the National Security Council for over three years. Initially, he was a director for Israeli-Palestinian Affairs and the Levant, and then was promoted to being acting senior director for Near, Near East and North African Affairs. At the State Department where we worked together, he received the Department's Superior Honor Award as a Middle East and Gulf Specialist on the Secretary of State's policy planning staff, and as a State Department Senior Middle East Political and Military Analyst. Prior to joining the State Department, he worked in Jerusalem as a journalist, covering Israeli and Palestinian politics. Rob holds an MSFS degree from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. He also completed a doctorate in the international relations of the Middle East from St. Anthony's College, Oxford University. But I save the best for last. He was an undergraduate here at UC Berkeley in history. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to welcome him back to Berkeley and please join, join me in welcoming Rob Deneen. Thank you, Neil. And thank you to the Institute of International Studies for hosting me here today. It's a real homecoming for me to be here today, uh, filled with much emotion and memories. Uh, I came to study here as an undergraduate at Berkeley 35 years ago. And I must say, I wouldn't be where I am professionally uh, were it not for UC Berkeley. Uh, I was in heaven as a student here. Uh, and indeed, one of the saddest days of my life was the day I graduated, because uh, I didn't want it to end. Uh, there was much here that I wanted to learn, and, but I knew that if I didn't leave, uh, I never would. And now I'm starting to question the wisdom of that. <laughs> but not knowing what I wanted to do with my life, uh, upon graduating from Cal in 1983, I saved up some money and I bought a one-way ticket from San Francisco to London and I uh, made my way uh, by, ra by rail to Athens and uh, ultimately arrived in Jerusalem, tired and broke. Uh, and there started a new journey, uh, one exploring the world between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, and that's where we start today. Early this year, the Middle East Quartet, the organization whose Jerusalem mission I headed for several years, held one of its periodic meetings in Munich. After an intense discussion on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, the principals, uh, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, uh, Secretary of State John Kerry, uh, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and EU High Representative Federica Megaroni uh, issued a, state, uh, a statement calling for Israelis and Palestinians to resume negotiations as soon as possible to reach a comprehensive peace. Such a, call, uh, such a call sounds logical and appropriate, but is it really the right course of action today? Should the U.S. once again delve into the precocious and uh, uh, perilous political uh, realm of uh, brokering diplomatic negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians. Does such an effort make sense, given that virtually nobody believes that these two leaders possesses, possess the capabilities or intention of concluding a final uh, end of conflict agreement today? And indeed, should this conflict even be the focus of high-level attention today, given the wars raging in the Middle East uh, from Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Libya? And why should the U.S. even care about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Historically, there have been four principal reasons that we have been involved in this conflict. The Arab-Israeli conflict was important to the United States during the Cold War because it risked becoming the flashpoint for superpower confrontation. Recall during the 1973 war, 
the U.S. and Soviet Union raised their nuclear alert postures. Even without the Cold War, reducing a major source of regional instability still is important to us, lest the Middle East conflicts and instability lead to a threat to the American homeland and indeed to our interests. Second, from the moment President Truman recognized Israel 11 minutes after it declared independence, the United States has had a special relationship with the Jewish state. This special relationship means that the United States is invested in Israel and identified with its conduct. Israel's character matters to us. We want Israel to be democratic and secure, recognized behind secure borders and not an occupying force. And a just outcome of the con to the conflict there is something that we've been interested in since 1948. Third, since we also have vital national interests in the Arab world, fighting a modus vivendi and reducing the friction between Israel and her neighbors, including the Palestinians, serves our interests. The more we can pull Israel and the Arab states onto the same side, the more effectively we can advance other regional interests. And fourth, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict takes place in a unique part of the world, the Holy Land. It's the wellspring of three monotheistic religions, and it speaks to large swaths of the American people, from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, to Jericho, New York, to Hebron, Kentucky, and Nazareth, Texas. Yet any questions regarding what to, the U.S. should do about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict must take into account where we are today. And today, the Israeli-Palestinian political track is once again stalemated. There are no negotiations taking place, and the United States has largely adopted a hands-off approach to, since John Kerry's nine-month intensive diplomatic effort to reach a conflict-ending agreement collapsed in failure last April. Now recall how we got here. Israel and the PLO reached an historic accommodation in 1993 in which they recognized each other's national rights and agreed to create a temporary administrative body, the Palestinian Authority, to govern Palestinian population centers in the West Bank for an interim of five years. During that time, Israel and the PLO were to negotiate a resolution to all their outstanding issues and claims, and Israel was supposed to hand over more territory, and the two would sign a peace agreement. Now, since then, there have been some minor advances and developments and one major meltdown, the Second Intifada, that left over 5,000 Palestinians and 1,000 Israelis dead. Three successive American administrations have mediated final status negotiations on the fundamental issues, borders, securities, refugees, Jerusalem, and settlements. President Clinton tried in 2000, President Bush tried in 2007, and President Obama tried in 2009 and 2014. And I was involved to some extent in three of those, but all failed. Maybe there may be a co connection there. <laughs> but a final status agreement eludes resolution. And today, no single party seems to have a coherent strategy forward towards ending it. Instead, all parties, I would argue, are largely focused on damage limitation, crisis avoidance, and jostling for tactical advantage. So let's look a little more closely at each side. The Palestinians. The Palestinian national movement today is facing one of its most serious crises in contemporary history. It's sharply divided ideologically, politically, and geographically. Neither of its two political organs, the Fatah and Hamas, have been able to pursue a clear course of action. The PLO and PA president, Mahmoud Abbas, drifts between alternative ad hoc approaches, submitting challenges to Israel and the International Court one day last week, only to call this weekend for a return to negotiations without preconditions. While the Palestinian national movement is frustrated over fruitless, uh, a fruitless approach that's been unable to forge a fully-fledged alternative, Israel's occupation over the West Bank places severe cons constraints over the PA and its ability to, to deliver services to the Palestinian population. The PA is allowed to operate in less than half of the West Bank, and the basic territorial and political division between Gaza and the West Bank continues. Hamas forcibly took over Gaza, defeating Hamas after Israel withdrew from Gaza 10 years ago. Gaza now is cut off from the West Bank, and access to both Egypt and Israel is severely limited. Repeated attempts to end the intra-Palestinian political divide in the split between Hamas and Fatah, including last summer's national unity agreement between Hamas and Fatah, have failed largely because neither faction is willing to cede control over the territories that it controls. Now, over sec on security, the Palestinian Authority has made some imp 
impressive strides and is now capable of providing law and order and security to Palestinian areas under its control. This is a remarkable achievement given that these security forces had been engaged, had been uh, comprised of over a dozen militias and engaged themselves in terrorism and violence against Israel. And yet reform efforts succeeded and the PLO uh, succeeded in, in exerting its uh, control over them. But today the PA is con economically stressed and finding it harder to justify security cooperation in Israel, which many Palestinians see as simply providing Israel security rather than serving Palestinian national interests. The Palestinian national movement is nearing the crossroads that's part of a generational shift. The, the generation that founded the modern national movement is on its way out. President Abbas just celebrated his 80th birthday. He was one of the first leaders to endorse a peaceful path with Israel, and he remains convinced that peace can only be reached through negotiations. But he's also disenchanted both with Israel and the United States, who he feels have not produced anything to match the Palestinians' historic compromise to settle their claims against Israel for once and all in return for full sovereignty in what was 22% of historic Palestine, that is, along the 1967 armistice line, or the Green Line. President Abbas is not groomed or even designated a successor to him as head of the PLO, as head of Fatah, and head of the Palestinian Authority. Adding to the unease and subterranean Palestinian squabbling and jockeying for position that is taking place today. This has encouraged a more heated Palestinian rhetoric since there's really no political gain to be had in Palestinian politics today from adopting a, moder a, mo a moderate and a cooperative approach to Israel. While Abbas wants conclusive negotiations, he's most vulnerable politically to open-ended talks with Israel that drag on endlessly while Israel changes the West Bank landscape. The Palestinian landscape, the Palestinian public, by and large today, justifiably or not, have concluded that they were wrong to pursue the Oslo path and negotiations. Because rather than prompt Israeli concessions, Palestinian nonviolence has produced Israeli complacency and satisfaction with the status quo, they argue. Meanwhile, Hamas also finds itself in search of a purpose and without a strategy. Unable to, to engage diplomatically, it's repudiated within the Palestinian mainstream by its association with the Muslim Brotherhood and despite failed efforts at unity. It's divided between an exiled leadership without a base, having fled Damascus in the wake of the violence and civil war there, and an internal leadership that is hunkered down in Gaza and has found the only path to political legitimacy is by repeatedly initiating violent conflict and launching rocket attacks into Israel. So now let's turn to Israel. The Palestinian issue remains largely a secondary concern within both Israeli politics and national security circles. It was largely absent as an issue in last month's national polls. And polls in Israel, public opinion polls, consistently suggest that a majority of Israelis are prepared to make a substantial territorial concession to the Palestinians for genuine peace. But at the same time, most Israelis believe there's currently no real Palestinian partner and no point to negotiations with a weak and fractured Palestinian movement, particularly while Hamas, a terrorist organization, implacably opposed to peace and recognition of Israel, is in control of Gaza. Indeed, I would say, uh, sense of resignation prevails in Israel. Israelis have managed to achieve a degree of freedom from violence other than the communities exposed to rockets from Gaza due to a combination of PA security efforts, continued IDF and Shin Bet security operations in the West Bank, and the so-called seamline barrier that separates the West Bank from Israel. This barrier has created a de facto separation in which Israelis and Palestinians no longer encounter one another other than at military checkpoints. Israeli politics today are largely allied against territorial con concessions. Prime Minister Netanyahu was re-elected last month and is in the process of forming a government with other right-wing and religious parties. Israel's opposition parties were largely ineffective during the last elections in making peace with the Palestinians a campaign priority. And Prime Minister Netanyahu campaigned as a steady pair of hands guiding the Israeli ship through stormy waters in a tumultuous Middle East region, not as a peacemaker. Now, in his previous two terms of office, Prime Minister Netanyahu pursued a twofold approach to the Palestinians, I would submit, calling for bilateral negotiations on all issues with no preconditions, 
while at the same time casting deep doubts about the sincerity and the capabilities of the Palestinian leadership. In 2009, June, soon after taking power, Prime Minister Netanyahu tried to mollify skeptics by declaring for the first time his willingness to accept a demilitarized Palestinian state side by side with the Jewish state. But under his leadership, Israel has pursued settlement expansion, and other than a limited 10-month settlement moratorium, uh, continued expansion. And Prime Minister Netanyahu's campaign comments last month, claiming that there would be no Palestinian state created under his leadership, led President Obama to note that it called into question the Prime Minister's commitment to a two-state solution. Prime Minister Netanyahu's four immediate predecessors as Prime Minister all undertook some form of diplomatic initiative vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians, thereby preempting plans that they calculated would be disadvantageous to Israel. In contrast, Prime Minister Netanyahu has been, what I would submit, as reactive. He's launched no serious initiatives. He's offered no concrete plans or alternatives put before him. Instead, he's put the onus on the Palestinians and the international community, and primarily the United States, to initiate political processes. This reactive approach is not cost-free for Israel. It's provided fodder to, to Israel's critics, those who seek to isolate it internationally. And such an, a reactive approach makes him and Israel more vulnerable to externally driven initiatives, not to his liking. And when Secretary of State Kerry's all or nothing approach uh, ended last April, the US put the blame largely on Israel and largely because of continued settlement expansion. The United States today finds itself struggling to put together policies that keep pace and provide strategic coherence to a Middle East that's going through a period of profound turmoil precipitated by the Arab uprisings that began in 2011. My former colleague, Ambassador Frank Wisner, spoke very eloquently about these challenges from this podium just a few months ago. And if you haven't seen or weren't in attendance, I recommend that you go onto the website and take a look at them, as I did, because they provide great insight into the region today. But he raised, and I would raise, what should the United States do today? Against the political, this, against the such a regional maelstrom, what should we do about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? There's no real consensus today. In policy discussions in Washington, in Ramallah, in Jerusalem, one hears many different suggestions bandied about. I would group these into basically five or six baskets of approaches. The first and most reflexive is the idea put forward to simply get the parties back to the negotiation table. The call for negotiated settlement based on ter territorial compromise, that is land for peace, has been at the core of US policy since at least 1967, when Security Council Resolution 242 was passed following the Six Day War. And it's been the centerpiece of US policy ever since. Now, as mentioned, this was the approach advocated by the United States and by the Quartet earlier this year. It's the one endorsed by Israel and at times by President Mahmoud Abbas, who, re who reiterated his interest just last weekend. Now, such talks could surely buy time, but they're also likely to devolve, to devalue the currency and attractiveness of negotiations, particularly for Israeli and Palestinian publics who are both supportive of the two-state solution, but also deeply pessimistic of reaching such uh, an accommodation. So taking into account the current governments in Israel and Palestine today and the record of previous negotiations, I think it's really hard to see how even the maximum Israeli offer on the final status issues would meet minimum Palestinian concessions required. I don't think anyone who thinks otherwise. At the other end of the spectrum are those who essentially argue in light of this that the US should devote its attention elsewhere in the region and in the world and stay away from Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking efforts entirely. And indeed, there are many reasons to do so. The parties display no urgency and seem more comfortable in the current situation than they are in taking st serious steps for peace. The US has been pressing issues to attend to elsewhere, and the Obama administration to launch another initiative would require precious dom domestic and diplomatic capital. Now, some will argue that off some will argue that that off-repeated line that we can't repeat that we can't want peace more than the parties themselves. So we should just tell the parties to call us when they're serious about peace. Such a call is tempting, 
And it would be perhaps a relief to many diplomatic colleagues to take a time out from peacemaking. But such an approach, I would argue, is both dangerous and possibly irresponsible, given our historic involvement. When it comes to Israeli-Palestinian relations, neglect is rarely benign. Left to their own devices, the situation is, large, is likely to re deteriorate. And the problem is not only the perpetuation of an undesirable status quo, it's the risk of losing some of the important achievements that have been reached in recent years, such as the security progress that I mentioned that was reconstituted after the Second Intifada, or the reform of the Palestinian Authority governing institutions that are now poised to rule Palestine upon independence. One often hears from Israelis and Palestinians that after over a century of interaction in a very small and confined space, that they know each other very well. My own experience as a diplomat shuttling between the two sides for many years is that both sides think they know one another very well. But that often leads them to ascribe the worst possible motivations and intentions behind every act taken by the other. And I've often seen profound misunderstandings between the two sides on matters large and small. And this required a third party, often me, to intercede and explain and translate the other side's actions and intentions. And so left to their own devices, I fear, they will not improve the situation left unattended. Now, a third set of ideas that many people are banding about is to move away from bilateral approaches towards international approaches. Now, there are two main variants of this idea. The first is what I would call punitive approaches, such as Palestinian efforts to accede to the Rome Statute and seek war crimes allegations against Israel in the International Criminal Court or to impose sanctions or divestment in Israel. These measures are largely designed to pressure and isolate Israel. President Abbas does not believe this route will liberate Palestine. Indeed, he, like the Palestinian leadership, see it more as a tactic to induce the Palestinian negotiating leverage and pressure Israel and level the playing field for future negotiations. The problem is that this punitive variant of internationalization is more likely to set off an action-reaction phenomenon in which actions taken against Israel will be met by corresponding efforts by Israel against the Palestinians. We already see an increase in Israeli restrictive measures on the West Bank in response to recent moves by President Abbas at the ICC. Such a dynamic is likely to lead, ultimately I fear, to violence, not restraint. But there's also a more benign or constructive form of internationalization one put forward by France, and one being considered today by the Obama administration. This variant seeks to enshrine the contours of a final negotiated settlement into a UN security resolution or US presidential statement. This effort to memorialize American negotiators' best sense of what could be the basis of a settlement and create terms of reference for future negotiations is one that is being discussed today. The cost-benefit of such a resolution or a presidential statement is one that's difficult to assess. While it's true that laying out parameters could help provide the basis for future talks, there's also a major downside. Unless it is tied to a serious follow-on diplomatic effort, such steps are likely to entail considerable political cost and virtually no payoff. It's a sort of dip diplomatic nuclear weapon one that's more potent as a threat and a last resort than one that's actually used. Take the Palestinian threat to seek recognition in the United Nations. For years, the Israelis were anxious and in greatly worried about Palestinian steps to pursue statehood in the United Nations. But now that the Palestinians have actually done it, the card has been played and Israelis now shrug it off. So once the US lays out the basis for a settlement, it must either be willing to follow it up with a real initiative, lest it fall without consequences, like the long forgotten Reagan plan of 1983, the Clinton parameters of 2000, or the Obama framework that was articulated in May 2011 and then not pursued. A fourth variant that is being discussed primarily among Israelis is the idea of unilateralism. This was the approach adopted by Ariel Sharon when in 2005, he initiated and conducted Israel's unilateral withdrawal from Gaza, uprooting some 8,000 settlers in the process. This unilateral impulse takes different forms today, 
But at its core, the proposal suggested by some Israeli strategists calls for Israel to withdraw its settler population from the West Bank, or at least those parts of the uh, West Bank east of the Seamline barrier, while retaining military control over the rest of the West Bank. The idea of unilateralism has not taken root in Israel's mainstream, but it's one that's really under discussion in, in serious policy circles. Its advocates, its advocates argue that the status quo is harmful to Israel's future, but at the same time, they have no Palestinian partner. Hence, they believe that acting unilaterally to separate Israelis and Palestinians would allow Israel to set temporary borders, preserve the state's Jewish majority, and improve the country's overall security position by devoting military resources to protecting settlers. Such a unilateral approach poses some problems, both conceptually and practically, however. It's hard to see how Israel withdrawing unilaterally empowers Palestinian moderates rather than radicals down the road. Witness the Gaza experience in 2005. Nor is it clear how Israelis benefit from shifting away from the core international proposition pursued since 1967, land for peace. As a practical matter, it's hard to see how even a politically strong prime minister could mobilize Israeli popular support for the pain and conflict that would accompany the evacuation of tens of thousands of settlers from the, at least parts of the West Bank with no immediate benefit in return. Excuse me. A fifth possible approach, one that the Palestinian leadership occasionally hints at, is one statism. Periodically, President Mahmoud Abbas suggests that simply dismantling the Palestinian Authority, turning over all administrative responsibilities and costs to Israel, is the way to go. This approach reflects a growing disenchantment amongst the Palestinian population, particularly the youth, who feel hemmed in between a largely corrupt and ineffectual Palestinian Authority and Israel's continued military occupation. So rather than fight for partition in a Palestinian state that's unlikely to be sovereign, independent, or contiguous, why not just stay put, allow, demogra allow demographic changes to basically continue, and towards a situation in which there are more Arabs than Jews living under Israeli control, and then seek full and equal rights within a, a unitary state, and slowly turn it into a binational state. It would make a return, really, to the original PLO, platform, which was a secular democratic state in all of historic Palestine. Now, this approach is actually mirrored, ironically, or not, on, by some on the Israeli right, such as Prime Minister Netanyahu's coalition partner, Naftali Bennett, who argued that Israel should keep all the territory between the Jordan River and Mediterranean, even if Palestinians constitute a majority of the population. The problem with the one-state approach is that it's not a solution. It's a possible outcome but I believe it's one that should be avoided, since I think it's also one that's certain to lead to conflict and violence. That's why every international body tasked to propose solutions to the conflict between the, Israel, between the Jewish and Palestinian Arab national conflict, starting with the Peel Commission in 1937, recommended partitioning the land between two separate bodies. There's no other way to begin to reconcile Israeli and Palestinian national aspirations. Now, some have argued for a regional approach, thereby expanding the scope of negotiations between, beyond a bilateral negotiation into a regional framework. This is not an entirely new idea. The 1991 uh, Peace Conference at Madrid and the 2000 Annapolis Conference adopted a two-track approach enveloping bilateral negotiations within a broader multilateral regional framework. In doing so, it reconciled divergent Israeli and Palestinian aspirations, whereby Palestinians seek an end to Israel's occupation, and Israel seeks peace and recognition from the broader Arab world. Perhaps the most promising example of this regional approach is the Arab Peace Initiative. Proposed over a decade ago by Saudi Arabia's then Crown Prince Abdullah, the idea, subsequently endorsed by the Arab League, offers Israel the goal it has long since sought since 1948, comprehensive peace, security, and diplomatic relations with the broader Arab world. But in return, the Arab states have called on Israel to agree to the creation of a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza with East Jerusalem as its capital. The proposal was originally rejected by Israel in 2002 when it was originally put forward as a take it or leave it proposal but it has since, since then been reaffirmed as a basis for negotiations for the Arab League, 
that is a basis for negotiations, not as the final uh, end of negotiations. And today, one finds more and more talk about the convergence of interest between Israel and the leading Sunni status quo-oriented regimes in the Middle East, such as Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and the other Arab Gulf states. It would obviously be a great thing from the perspective of American national interest to bring about peace between Israel and the Arab world. But the regional approach, approach still requires that Israel be willing to make the peace based on a return to the 1967 armistice lines, including the creation of a Palestinian state in East Jerusalem. A regional approach may be desirable, but there can be no such approach without Israel willing to accommodate Palestinian national negotiating demands, which does not seem to be in the cards right now. So if none of these approaches can succeed in forging a path to peace, then what should the United States do? I don't have a magic formula, but it seems to me the following. William Zartman, who's written extensively on negotiations theory, has noted that while most studies on peaceful settlements of disputes focus on the substance of negotiations, the timing of the negotiations are also key. Parties resolve their conflicts when they're ready to and when alternative means of achieving a satisfactory result are blocked and the parties feel that they are in an uncomfortable and costly predicament. At that ripe moment, they seek or, amen or amenable to proposals that offer a way out. When it comes to the Israeli-Arab conflict, the only time that there have been real diplomatic breakthroughs for peace have been because we've had one, if not two, leaders willing to lead, take political risks, and make difficult decisions. Israeli-Egyptian peace occurred because Anwar Sadat was willing to travel to Jerusalem and break the rejectionist taboo on engaging Israel and because Menachem Begin was subsequently willing to relinquish all of the Sinai back to Egypt. The Oslo Accords, however flawed, are still important as they signify mutual recognition between the Zionist and Palestinian national movements and provide a framework forward towards a peaceful end of conflict. And they happened because Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat were willing to do it. So for reasons that I tried to spell out in this talk, I would argue we do not have in Israel or in Palestine the kind of political alignment of forces that are needed for the conclusion of such a peace agreement. Both sides' leaders have other priorities and even credible reasons for adopting the positions that they hold. And I think that both have been sufficiently tested to suggest that neither is about to initiate a major historic breakthrough, though I would love to be proven wrong. But just because the situation is not ripe for conflict resolution does not mean that there is not important work to be done. Indeed, I think one of the most important aspects that have been neglected by US officials in recent years has been the pre-negotiation phase that's necessary to prepare the groundwork for talks. So if the parties are not prepared to sit down and resolve their differences, there are still important steps that could be helpful to prepare the groundwork for future settlement. I would suggest that there are more immediate tasks to be taken now that the parties are in a position uh, to, that the parties are no longer in a position to return to the negotiating table. None of what I'm about to suggest is easy. In fact, the steps may be impossible. But without them, I don't see how you can ever success, sec, successfully conclude peace negotiations between credible Israeli and Palestinian leaders. On the Palestinian side, Palestinian institutions and leaders have lost legitimacy. There have been no elections in Palestine for almost a decade, and the institutions there, such as the legislature, are moribund. Moreover, much of this is due to the division between Gaza and the West Bank, Hamas and Fatah. One of the biggest flaws, I believe, to the last American approach of bringing the parties to back to the table was proceeded as if we were still in the 1990s and that the divide within Palestinian politics did not exist. Today, the PLO only controls half of the territory under the Palestinians' uh, jurisdiction. This is a huge problem because even if an agreement were reached, it means that those outside the political framework, that is Hamas, have, an, have a veto over any kind of agreement that would be reached. This approach also forces negotiators, such as Abu Mazen, into maximalist positions because they have critics on the outside who are um, just standing poised to criticize any kind of concessions that they'd be willing to make.
So part of preparing for a return to negotiations, I believe, requires the Palestinian House to be put back in order. This means that the U.S. should be working with regional allies, such as Egypt and Jordan and Saudi Arabia, to help bring about Palestinian reconciliation. Real reconciliation then will require elections and a resuscitation of Palestinian institutions and a credible Palestinian partner for negotiations. Elections, I believe, should put Hamas to a test, participate in the PLO and the PA, but on terms that have been agreed to already, nonviolence and an agreement to those, the principles that govern the institutions that Hamas wants to take over. No one expects parties to participate in elections to which they don't agree to the basic tenets of the institutions to which they are seeking to take over. On the Israeli side, if indeed we're going to put off a final settlement, then we need to arrest the dynamic that is making increasingly unlikely the feasibility of a contiguous and viable Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. Here I would submit there are three important sets of measures that we could undertake with Israel uh, to help advance that. First and foremost, I think it's incumbent on the Israeli leadership to put forward a credible notion that the end of the peace, that the successful resolution of the peace process means that the end of occupation will end. That is, the occupation will end. Palestinians today do not believe that, and unless Palestinians are brought to believe that, there will not, they will not invest in a peace process. Secondly, Israel's population growth in both East Jerusalem and the West Bank have called into question the prospects of implementing any two-state solution, even if, one, if such an agreement were reached. There are now approximately half a million Israelis living east of the Green Line, according to Israel's Central Bureau of Statistics. Freezing the dynamics on the ground that are making less credible by the day the notion that there can be a Palestinian state is something that is necessary. And that means finding a way to take on the settlement enterprise, not for the sake of the Palestinians, but the, for the sake of Israel as a democratic and Jewish state. Prime Minister Netanyahu instituted a moratorium on settlement activities for 10 months at the urging of, of President Obama. This was done within the context of a peace process. I would submit that the United States should urge Prime Minister Netanyahu to do it outside the context of a peace process as a way to buy time. Combined with that, I would encourage, uh, I would uh, submit that the United States should encourage the Israeli government to, pro to provide incentives to those settlers uh, to leave those outlying territories. The logic here has been traditionally that in the context of, of a peace agreement, Israel would um, in, uh, provide incentives for settlers to leave um, those territories that would fall into a Palestinian state. Today, there are great incentives to Israelis to settle in those areas. I would urge that we delink the, the, uh, the incentives for settlement activity from the peace process and make it as part of a placeholder, again, it needs to be framed as not as a gift to the Palestinians, but something that is useful and desirable for Israel and desirable for the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Now, this is not a very attractive or very exciting set of proposals, but it's about the best I can do. Um, and I'd be more than welcome to uh, entertain your questions. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you today. Take questions. Let me just note that Rob has a blog connected with Council on Foreign Relations called Middle East Matters, and posts I think once a week. And, Try to. Uh, I think uh, sometimes twice a week. Yeah. I, I didn't track it closely, but in any case, there's a, a place you can go to for continued analysis by Rob. Um, I'm going I'm to also use on the, Twitter. <laughs> also on Twitter. I'm going to use the microphone. Take questions. I saw one first in the middle here. I'll hand you the microphone. It's so that we uh, have the question for the recording, not so much so that you can be heard in this room. So please use the mic when I hand it to you. How important is it for to Netanyahu and Israel for the United States to continue to veto resolutions at the Security Council? And might the United States, what would happen if the United States said to Israel, we'll maintain the veto if you do maybe the three things that you just suggested? Um, this is a question uh, that 
White House officials are actually uh, asking themselves right now. Uh, traditionally, the United States has provided a veto uh, protection for Israel in the Security Council. Um, and right now, uh, the United States is asking itself whether or not, you know, one, the threat of removing the veto is something that could be used to incentivize uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, and secondly, whether or not there is a resolution that could be brought about that actually would not require a veto. Uh, so those are two separate issues. Fundamentally, um, in Israel, uh, in security circles, in national security circles, there's a recognition that, um, that its relationship with the United States is a strategic pillar. And if you, if I could diver, uh, digress for one moment, you know, when, uh, and anticipating perhaps a question that might come up about the Iran discussions, in, a, you know, in Israel today, there is a consensus about Iran. Um, now, and the threat that it poses uh, as a potential nuclear power. But there's a real division in Israel about how to handle it. And the division about how to handle it really centers around the relationship with the United States. It's not about Iran. It's about how Israel can, how effective Israel can be by itself and how effective uh, and how critical is the relationship with the United States and the strategic pillar uh, has been. Uh, and I think Israelis are wrestling this with this because the traditional Israeli, the traditional Zionist ethos was one of self-reliance um, and, uh, and a belief that Israel has to be capable to defend itself by itself. And yet over the years, what has developed is Israel's become part of an interdependent world in which its relationship with the United States is a critical pillar. And I think Israel is struggling with this. Um, and it's important to recognize that there is this struggle. Uh, between one impulse, which is to want to be fully independent, like all countries do, and yet a recognition of its real place in the world, when, which it, in which it is interdependent. That's a segue into the question I was going to ask you about uh, is Israeli-U.S. relationship, whether the um, Netanyahu, uh, Obama, uh, incompatibility, I'll put it nicely, is an ephemeral factor or whether there has been a sea change given the mutual politicalization that took place with regard, that is taking place with regard to elections and party politics. Uh, are we now at a different place? It's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> and clearly, six or seven years into this bilateral relationship between these two individuals, uh, relations are strained uh, on a personal level. And, and I can say that, you know, as someone who's worked in the White House, um, the relationship between world leaders matters. Uh, this goes against the traditional, you know, sort of Graham Allison and, and you know, bureaucratic politics uh, and the notion that, uh, or in, in international relations theory, the idea that states behave according to interest only. These are all important variables. But personalities are important, and the personalities between leaders are important. And what it means at the most basic is that when there are critical moments and decisions to be taken, that relationship and the degree of trust in which there exists can make the difference between certain choices that are made. Um, and right now, I don't think either leader is willing to cut the other a, a break or, 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 or trust the other um, and the other's word or intentions. And that has a corrosive effect on the bilateral relationship, and it has a corrosive effect within the bureaucracies and national security structures of both countries. Um, we don't know whether or not you know, this will be rectified or changed by th the next presidential election, or if, in fact, it has been so corrosive and also parallels other um, trends that have been taking place, uh, trends that have to do with Trend, demographic changes in the United States, demographic changes in Israel, uh, political changes in both. You know, obviously what was so disconcerting to many in Washington was, uh, regarding the visit of Prime Minister Netanyahu and his speech before the Congress was the notion that what had been a bipartisan political support for Israel was becoming and risked becoming a partisan issue. 
and that Israel become, risks becoming a partisan issue within American politics and support for uh, Israel be, uh, risks becoming a partisan issue. But I think, you know, soberly and, and dispassionately, one can look into the Democratic Party and see that there are generational changes taking place and that the role of Israel and the views of Israel uh, are changing along all sorts of lines. I'm sure you see it here on the campus of UC Berkeley. Um, and I would argue that's in part a, an effect of the changes that have taken place that, you know, uh, have seen Israel go from being perceived as being the David against a sea of Goliaths in the Arab world to perception today in the popular image of Israel as the Goliath against a Palestinian David. And that changed narrative is having an effect in, 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 in certain circles in American politics. Um, and uh, it, I think, is a, a, an issue for concern and should be an issue of concern for the Israeli leadership and for the American leadership. If indeed we wish to seek the continued uh, strong um, bipartisan support for Israel in the United States and a strong U.S.-Israel bilateral relationship. A uh, brief note, uh, we have an embarrassment of riches today at Berkeley because there were two lectures planned. My colleague Harold Smith and I try and deconflict, and we did the best we could today. But there is another talk on um, uh, strategic situations in the Middle East downstairs. We will continue with this for several more minutes and uh, uh, questions and answers. But I just did want to allow for that brief commercial uh, interruption uh, on, on behalf of my colleague Harold Smith. So I'm, the next question is right here. We're not encouraging you to leave, however. <laughs> but no offense will be taken. Thank you. Um, any credible partner would have to be able to enforce the terms of a peace on his people. Uh, and if that which asserts and can exert a monopoly on force is a state, could it mean anything to make peace with a non-state actor? Or is only a state uh, a competent partner for peace? Could you take that one more, go a little further with that? Because you have something in mind, but I'm not sure where you're going. Is it nonsense to talk about peace before statehood? Um, you know, this is a, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, I would point to something that has largely been forgotten, which was the so-called roadmap for peace. Uh, that was put forward uh, by the quartet in 2003. Uh, the roadmap put forward a three-stage process towards an end of conflict. The first stage was reform, uh, of largely of Palestinian institutions, uh, the security services, uh, the political institutions. This was taking place uh, during the Second Intifada when violence was raging, when Arafat was holed up in the Mukatta and seen as complicit in terrorism. And it was meant as a way to how do we get from this horrible situation to the goal that had been put forward by President Bush of two states living side by side in peace and security. The way forward had been put forward as the roadmap, as a staged approach. And so phase one was this reform process. This was the creation of the quartet office in Jerusalem that I headed. What we were trying to do was work on reform. And in fact, I would submit, and I had referred to in my remarks, that I think we largely succeeded. Stage two of the roadmap was meant to be a state, a state with interim borders, uh, that would then uh, be in a position to negotiate peace. And so in many ways, the roadmap framework uh, uh, you know, mirrors what you're suggesting. That, and um, you have people in Israel today who suggest that Israel made a huge fundamental um, mistake in, in opposing Palestinian statehood and argue that Israel should be at the forefront of, uh, of recognizing Palestine as a state and then basically be in a situation where you say, okay, you have Israel, you have Palestine, now we'll negotiate our, the final contours of our settlement. Um, I think it's an important idea uh, and one that, that um, should be uh, taken, taken up. And the problem is, and this is the danger and the, and the, and the reason that the Palestinians have always uh, balked at this idea, is their fear is that by creating a state without any real territorial component, it risks uh, becoming not an interim measure, but a final measure. And that you'll be in a situation in which you will have Israel and Palestine uh, and a territorial dispute, and that the kind of international pressure 
and saliency to this issue will be gone. Israel can say, okay, we have a dispute and, uh, and, and international tension will go away. Um, and so that's why I stressed in my comments that there has to be a sense that the temporary and the interim is not the permanent and that there has to be a sense uh, that the end of occupation is coming. You know, one of the flaws I think in the, in the Oslo process was, you know, that this five-year interim period is now more than 20 years old and there's no sense that it's going to end. And so it's lost credibility and we have to find ways to infuse it with credi credibility. But that's hard with each of the passing year. Is this an interjection on this point? Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to take a brief interjection and then I'll come back to you with the question. So we'll do this. Um, right, so the other side of that is that um, Netanyahu and the right wing, as you implied, are heading toward a one state solution, which would be that Israel takes over all of Israel and Palestine. The problem there, as it's been stated many times that you either have apartheid or you have a, or you, you can't have a democracy and a Jewish state. And how do you deal with that? You have apartheid or, you know, it's all unacceptable. Right. But that's the direction they're heading. That's the reality. So how do you see that? Well, I, you know, that's why I said in my remarks, there is no such thing as a one state solution. There's a one state outcome. Uh, and it's a very ugly one. Uh, and it's one that doesn't serve, I would submit, either side's uh, long-term interest. So that's why I think it's something we should be working to prevent. Here, and then I'll come back. I'm intrigued by the way you've outlined this pre-negotiation period and the opportunities available. Could you comment, if you are aware, of activities on the ground among civil society groups and people-to-people -people efforts where Palestinians, Israelis are working together and their role in this period. Yeah. Um, sure. I, you know, I've been involved and in, still am involved in a number of these efforts, and I was there last month. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in my, one of the lines I put forward was that the only place that Israelis and Palestinians today meet today are in, at checkpoints. And one of the unintended consequences of the seam line barrier that was created by Israel, wall or fence, pick your nomenclature, um, you know, is to separate the two populations. And when I first started visiting this territory in 1977, they were intermixed. You didn't know where the Green Line was. You didn't know where the West Bank was. Israelis and Palestinians moved freely between the two sides. People didn't even have a mental map anymore of it. And that had pluses and minuses. Uh, it meant that both sides could benefit from the fruits of the other, but clearly it was not um, acceptable to one side because it led to the first intifada in which the Palestinians basically uh, er, you know, rose up in order to throw off the Israeli military occupation. Um, and as a result, you had this very painful separation between the two populations. You had hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who had been working in Israel on a daily basis, given the unequal or the sort of dispar disparities in their national economies. Uh, and you had what was called, you know, by one Palestinian economist uh, referred to it as a forced uh, structural readjustment, uh, which the Palestinians were forced to seek work inside their own territories, no longer in Israel. Um, but you had a generation or a few generations of, of Israelis and Palestinians who had been, in, you know, were doing commerce and, and engaged in all sorts of activities. And after the Oslo Accords, you had a you know, flowering of people-to-people -people initiatives. Uh, and the State Department and other institutions were involved heavily in funding these. Today, you know, th they've shrunk. They've shrunk tremendously. They've shrunk in part because of the disenchantment with peace. They've shrunk uh, in, for budgetary reasons. Uh, and they've shrunk because both sides are fatigued. Uh, you know, the idea of peace and reconciliation that was so commonplace after the Oslo Accords were so, was so destroyed, really, if not damaged, by the Second Intifada. I mean, the Second Intifada really, I liken the Second Intifada to a situation in which you catch your spouse cheating. Um, and once you do that, it's very hard to go back and reconstitute the trust that had existed. 
And so the, the, the outpouring of hope that had existed after the handshake on the White House lawn between Rabin and Arafat was so destroyed by the Second Intifada um, that the idea of people-to-people -people kind of exchanges is really discredited. Now, to me, that's important to note, but it also, this is why I also stress that it's almost miraculous that in the wake of the Second Intifada, the sorts of steps that have been, we have been successful at, at reconstituting security cooperation, at reforming Palestinian institutions, at resuming final status negotiations, that all these things have happened despite the breakdown in trust that led the two sides to actually fight one another and kill thousands of each other's citizens is, is, is amazing. Um, so I think there needs to be more done uh, on the people-to-people -people side. But again, if people think this is just an open-ended um, process, then it risks being discredited as normalization in the Palestinian eyes. Because, then it's, because for them, normalization is a codification of the status quo in, in, in an unequal situation. And that's why there has to be some approach that revives the notion that, that this is a dynamic that is leading to a conclusion that entails the end of occupation and the realization of both sides' national aspirations. Related, related to the question before about the, 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 the false state, or do you need a state before peace, wouldn't the outgrowth of a Security Council resolution recognizing a state at some point in the future inevitably be a false state? I mean, it, it can't really create. They're not going to send in armies, I don't think, to enforce it. So is it, could it really create a state in the real sense or just another false state? promise. Um, you know, at what point does a state become a state? Um, well, it has to have territory, like, like you said. And true. But increasingly, we find that sovereignty is circumscribed in the international order. And, all, and other than large states, most small states are not fully sovereign in some form. So at a certain point, a state has to have cre be credible. Um, and you have the elements of, 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 of a credible state in place in Palestine today. You do have security services. You do have uh, uh, self-governance. Um, what you don't have is contiguity. Uh, what you don't have is control over borders. Uh, you don't have a currency. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things I did not talk about was a phenomenon that, that I, I wrote about. I wrote an article in Foreign Affairs called uh, Fiatism and Its Discontents. Um, I didn't talk about it because Fiatism has largely been discredited in, in Palestinian politics today. But Salam Fayyad was someone who had been appointed finance minister by Yasser Arafat and was tasked really with implementing the reform measures uh, put forward in the roadmap. And so Arafat, uh, uh, Fayyad came along and started to tackle the fact that the PLO essentially had a patronage system in place and the Palestinian Authority had a patronage system in place in which there was no accountability. And so Fayyad started doing things like putting the Palestinian salaries um, on the website so that uh, we could see where the money was going. He slowly took Arafat's fingers off the tills, one by one. Um, and in doing so, started to help create the makings of a modern, um, transparent, uh, I don't know if you would call it democratic, but representative um, political order. And Fayyadism represented, in my mind, a real breakthrough in Palestinian thinking. Because traditionally, the Palestinian national movement had been dedicated either to resistance through violent means or through a notion that the international community should bring about a state for the Palestinians through diplomatic means or pressure on Israel. And in a way, Fayyad took a page out of the Zionist playbook, um, which was to say, no, in addition to these international efforts, we need to develop Palestinian institutions from the bottom up. And so Fayyad's line was, we must fight the, you know, build a state 
under occupation and despite the occupation. And so, you know, in my dealings as an American official, Fayad was one of the first Palestinian officials that you met with who would come in and would not spend the whole meeting talking about Israel, but instead talking about Palestine. And it was not to say that he in any way diminished the importance and the overwhelming weight of the Israeli occupation, but he said, okay, that's the situation we have today. What, do, what can we do to get out of this? Now, I mention this now only because this approach was very empowering for Palestinians and was, was meant to be transformative and, and really gave, you know, I think a lot of Palestinians and a lot of others hope that there could be a way out and a way forward. Um, but it, it didn't match it for a variety of reasons. Ultimately, Fayad was an independent, is an independent, um, and could not come up against the sort of the Fatah party hegemony um, and was ultimately taken down by it. Um, so, I'm sorry, I, in a way I've lost my train of thought, but you're... you're I, I was talking, my question was, could a U, UN a Security Council resolution stating that we would recognize a Palestinian state at some point in the future really create a real state, or would it just be some words that in the end wouldn't... No, wouldn't I, do okay, I mean, directly to the point, I think that any kind of initiative has to have then an implementing path forward. That's why I took issue with the notion of either the President of the United States standing up and giving, you know, parameters without a then, a, the word therefore has to be in it. President Obama stood up in May of 2011 and gave a great speech at the State Department. Um, and he laid out the contours of, of uh, what a Palestinian state could look like. He articulated the idea of uh, uh, the border between Israel and Palestine being the 1967 line with mutually agreed upon swaps. He talked about Israel as a Jewish state. He laid it out. Um, but there was no therefore. And so then the speech just went on the shelf and into the history books. And without that, either from a presidential statement or a Security Council resolution, then I think no. A, a, a resolution alone is not going to do anything. Question here, and then we'll come back here, here, and here. Yeah, I got you. I, I think what you just said goes, is, gives rise to my question. Um, this talk about American policy and the influence it has in the Middle East. I have to say pessimistically that I don't think it has much influence at all anymore. I don't believe, and, and I guess that's 1A of my question, do you believe that the United States, under virtually any scenario, would go to war were Israel to be seriously threatened? And since I don't, it seems to me, and although that's a change from maybe even 10 years ago or 20 years ago when our allies and the Arabs may well have thought that might happen, I don't know that that's so likely. To, I don't personally believe it will happen. I don't believe most of our allies believe it would happen. So the question is, one, do you think that we would actually, under any scenario, and therefore have a policy which we would require it, go to war for Israel in some situation? And two, if not, the question then is, what if we simply washed our hands of it and said, we are now officially neutral with respect to whatever goes on in Israel? How would the world look the next day if we said that? Um, well, no, I don't think that that's uh, uh, actually a possibility. I mean, or put in the positive, yes, I do believe that there are red lines uh, that could be crossed for which the U.S. would go to war. Uh, I think President Obama uh, is serious when he says that um, the United States will not allow Iran to obtain nuclear weapons. Uh, and that entails the use of military force at the end of the day. He soft, he puts a soft tone on it or uh, he underplays it in order because um, he wants that to be the, the, the weapon of last resort. Um, and, and I'll come to that, back to that in a second. But, you know, you're right in the sense that, I mean, implicit in your quest, second question was a criticism, which is to say that if indeed our allies in the world believe that we don't have red lines that, to which uh, we'll stand up uh, to, to uphold, uh, then what does that do to U.S. credibility? You know, 
when, for example, uh, Bashar al-Assad used uh, chemical weapons against uh, uh, the Syrian people after the president said that would be a red line and then we didn't use uh, force, uh, this was met with despair, really, throughout the Arab world, throughout the Sunni Arab world, with our allies in the Gulf. Um, this accord that's uh, being negotiated now between the U.S. and Iran is something that's as much of concern to uh, the Sunni Arab states in the Gulf and to Egypt as it is to Israel. They just have different ways of expressing their uh, uh, attitudes about it. Um, but one of the biggest issues is that about U.S. credibility. Um, and one of the things that, look, there are some things that have undermined American credibility, uh, but, but to be fair, they're hard calls. For example, the Egyptian re re uh, revolution in 2011 that deposed uh, Hosni Mubarak. You know, this was an, you know, President Obama essentially supported the Egyptian revolution. Um, this was something that caused great despair amongst some of our allies. What kind of friend is this? You know, 30 years of support for Hosni Mubarak and we're willing to let him go. Um, in my mind, and I don't want to get too far afield, that was a tough call. And, you know, foreign policy, especially at the highest levels, are choices between bad and worse. And that was a, that was a tough choice. Uh, I would submit to have the United States stand behind a Hosni Mubarak that would have then mowed down um, thousands of demonstrators in the streets of Cairo using American weapons in order to uh, impose repression would have also had uh, conse uh, consequences for U.S. credibility. Uh, you know, what kind of regimes is it that we back in the Middle East? So that was a, you know, in a sense, it was a no-win. But... But, but, but just sort of say, you know, but, but the Gulf states to this day resent the fact that we let Mubarak, we threw Mubarak under the bus. Um, and what did that do to U.S. credibility? So there were always going to be those who, you know, who are going to criticize us at a certain point. But the, the problem of Iran is this, and this is, it, 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 you know, is that U.S. and Israeli goals are not in alignment here. You know, we have different goals vis-a-vis -vis Iran. We don't want Iran to get nuclear weapons. Israel doesn't want Iran to get nuclear weapons capabilities. Their litmus test is much more stringent. They want to push the Iranians much further back in the cycle. And that really is the, the, the root of the, of the differences we have today. Please. I, I, was a little, I appreciate what you're saying, but I, I was a little less concerned. I'm not concerned so much about the credibility issue as the actual diplomatic impact were we to suddenly announce, which is a little unlikely, that we are neutral on the issue of, of Israel. What will the world and the Arabs and everybody involved then do that they're not doing now? Or it's not going to happen. Well, it's, I know not, it's not going to happen. It's an extreme scenario to identify the issue. What does it mean for Israel that we are sort of behind them as opposed to being neutral? Look, whenever we take a, if, if I mean, in the specific case, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because the wellspring of American support for Israel exists. And this is not a function, I mean, this is, I didn't want to get into it in the talk because it, it's a diversion, but when I talked about U.S. interest in Israel, I, I touched upon it. I mean, you know, American support for Israel is not something that's just a function of my, you know, certain interests. I mean, it reflects mainstream American uh, opinion. Yes, it, it, uh, and we can get into that. Uh, so, but at the end of the day, you know, there is a large uh, wellspring of support for Israel and that goes way beyond and in fact is much deeper in communities other than the American Jewish community. Um, so I just don't see that happening. But look, in a more general sense, whenever a country like the United States uh, were to take a major diplomatic shift, be it Nixon's reach, uh, you know, uh, policy outreach to China, or now the outreach to Iran. You know, there are going to be allies and regional partners who are going to be extremely anxious, to say the least. And that's where statecraft comes in. You know, when Obama, and I'm sorry to ramble on, but I, um, I'll just add this point. You know, when Obama first reached the, the Joint Plan of Action Accord with Iran, you know, I asked some of the China hands that I knew, um, how did Nixon manage it? How did Matt Nixon manage the allies uh, at the time? How do, you, you know, how do you keep Japan on board when you're about to reach out to communist China? In the same way, you know, I would suggest that it, and, and the answer is it can be done. And Nixon and Kissinger did it. Um, and in many ways, I think that the, the testing of whether or not there's a 
Iranian option, if you will, for U.S. foreign policy is a worthy goal. I have some issues with the way it's been handled, with the statecraft, if you will. I don't think we've done a very effective job at keeping our allies' concerns assuaged sufficiently in order to test the Iranians' proposition. And when I mentioned that the, you know, I think the president underplays at this point the threat that Iran continues to pose, um, I don't think that's doing either the negotiations with Iran a service or U.S. national interest or our, our allies a service. Oh, thank you. Yes, um, I, I'm just following up on a point you made earlier that uh, c countries don't actually make compromises for peace in this situation uh, without um, it being the right time to do so or having a pre outside pressure to do so. Um, and I, I, you know, I think your, your prescriptions that we uh, encourage the Israelis to, to stop building settlements or to uh, pay settlers to go home are, are uh, haven't worked, and they aren't going to work, especially with a government Israeli coalition. We're about to see with the kind of rhetoric we've we've heard, and that. Uh, so I'm I'm going back to my my friend here's question about uh, the UN yeah. and the veto and the U.S. Israel relationship, and I'm I'm saying I think uh, Netanyahu tells his people, uh, his followers, if you want, certainly the ones in the center, center right that can maybe be changed, that he can manage the situation. Don't worry, I've got, I can handle the states, I've got a relationship with Congress, you don't have to worry, the Americans will not veto. So I think it could send a very strong message that the status quo, which right now works in Israel, there's no real need to make any, take any risk for peace because the status quo, it, it, it works. And to, the, what, to what extent could that, could that the uh, absence of an American veto, uh, and therefore the sense that maybe we don't have the situation managed, to what extent could that affect um, Israeli behavior, in your opinion? Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say a couple things. I mean, first of all, and I didn't articulate this well because I was concerned about time, what I was trying to suggest about the settlements is, is, that, is that we try to come up with an understanding with Israel about settlement activity that is not rooted in negotiations with the Palestinians, but is more rooted in our bilateral relationship. Um, I worked in the, in the George Bush White House, uh, I, uh, and, uh, which is something I never thought would happen. Uh, but as a loyal civil servant, um, I was proud to do so. And, you know, we had tremendous differences with Israel. Um, and, but we were very effective at managing them. And one of the things we did was we came up with a very quiet, not secret, but quiet, understanding with Israel about settlement activity, um, in which we were quite tough, in which we were very, uh, and this was President Bush and Condoleezza Rice as the National Security Advisor, in which we argued, look, we need s settlement activity circumscribed. And, you know, we had a very intensive back and forth negotiation between the White House and the Prime Minister's office about what would constitute acceptable behavior, what would constitute violations or red lines, if you will. The danger always was we didn't want to be seen to be validating settlement activity, but we did come to an understanding that severely limited settlement activity. And that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about in this context. If we go for an absolute settlement freeze that's hermetic, that would meet international standards, we won't meet it. And that's why, um, but, but we can slow down things significantly. But so let me, that wasn't directly to your question, but I wanted to take that as an opportunity to, to, to say something about that. You know, look, yes, if we decide to no longer veto Israeli uh, 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 resolutions that are anti-Israel, it will have an effect. Um, but as, you know, in the context of the other question, we'll also have, it will have all sorts of effects, both in terms of our relationship with Israel, but also globally. Um, and so I think that at the end of the day, it has, it would ultimately, you can only measure it within the context of the specific resolution. Um, you know, if it's a resolution that is one that's uncomfortable to Israel, but one that we feel reflects American interests, that's one thing. Um, and that's something like that, you know, President Obama in his first term vetoed a resolution on Jerusalem in which effectively uh, the president's own words were, be, were, were used, were put together into a resolution and he was forced to, to, to veto or felt forced to veto. Um, that's something I doubt he would do today. 
um, because it reflects American policy. Uh, so that kind of, you know, I would distinguish between a, a veto that, you know, is just an automatic veto versus one in which, as put forward by the French in December when the United States voted against the resolution, at that point in time, last December, the French put forward a, a resolution uh, that the United States was hoping would move into the range of something it could abstain on. Um, and at the end of the day, the resolution owing to certain developments within Palestinian domestic politics got increasingly outside the realm of what the United States could accept and we voted no. And in a way, it, it, it took the onus off of us. Um, and it was by design. And this is one of the many ironies of, of Middle East politics. You had a situation in which the Palestinian president actually toughened up a resolution so that the United States would veto it as a gift to the United States um, so that it wouldn't have to veto a resolution uh, in, in the lead up because the perception was at right now in the lead up to the Israeli elections, it would be a bad time for this kind of conflict. So, you know, things get very uh, complicated in, 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 in the real world of, 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 of UN resolutions. But look, I, so I think it's, you know, it's not a panacea. If, if the United States withdraws its um, veto, it will have an effect, but I think that you know, a lot of these, as I tried to suggest in my comments earlier, a lot of these things are more potent as threats than they are actually once they're played. You do it once, you remove the veto, and you no longer have the ability to exert any leverage over your partner as something you want as an inducement to, to good behavior. So you have to measure it within the context of the resolution. Can I ask a follow -up? Just on that very point? Yeah. Yes, go ahead. If, if you were if you were the Secretary of State, would you take a look at the veto, the potential veto and go to Israel and say, okay, let's cut a deal. I will continue, we will continue to veto these resolutions if you give us A, B, and C. Would that be a viable strategy? Are there things that might move Netanyahu? Again, it's hard to argue these things outside of context. Um, it depends what it is you're trying to achieve um, and, in, and, and at one point in time. I mean, I guess what, we, what we're really talking about here is this often, you know, is, is the question about, you know, U.S. pressure on Israel, right? And there's this kind of line out there, well, when the U.S. is really serious, it will just, you know, get tough with Israel and then we'll get what we want. My experience in dealing with you know, U.S.-Israeli relations over many decades has been, sure, um, diplomatic pressure can work, but not open-endedly and not sort of universally. That the United States is most effective in the context of some effort that it's trying to achieve with Israel as a partner, but then as you get into the end game, that's when you then, uh, invoke tough love. Um, and this is an art, not a science. You have to have a relationship with Israel of trust so that at a certain point you, and, and I've been in, I was in negotiations with the Israelis at a certain point in which we were negotiating some, over Israel's disengagement from Gaza. And I'll never forget the national security advisor at a certain point said to the Israeli national security advisor, enough. On this, you're going to have to trust us. And if you don't, then we'll, let's end the discussion now. And, and it was tough. It was one of those moments where you felt like, wow, this is like the West Wing. I mean, it was like <laughs> very dramatic. Uh, it's very rare, actually, in real <laughs> diplomacy that you have such dramatic moments. And, um, and so I would suggest that only at certain critical moments can that kind of pressure work. As a universal in general, no. You're, it's going it's gonna, uh, to gonna unravel. Just to give one historical example, in 1975, President Ford, after I forgot what Israel did, in a feed, fit of peak, um, suspended military uh, deliveries to Israel. Uh, Phantom jets, I believe it was, or, or um, something, advanced fighter aircraft, right? Well, within a certain amount of time, Congress, uh, the Senate, passed a, 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 circulated a letter and forced the administration to back down. And so the point being that if you're going to, if you're going to take the gloves off, 
with Israel. You might have a window of opportunity, but other fo forces are going to come into play. And at a certain point, you're going to lose your effectiveness. So that's why, again, I think um, this sort of question about, you know, this, these are tactics. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, you know, pressure can work, but within a larger context of, of, uh, of trust. At a certain point, if the relationship is just confrontational, as we've seen over the last six years, you're not going to have any leverage. We always have a surplus of questions and a deficit of time. This gentleman's been waiting very patiently. I know others have. So I'm going to take this last question and then we're going to adjourn. Although I think you can probably call her Rob privately to pose a couple additional questions if you, if you so wish. So last question over here. Try to be quick. Um, a little bit earlier, you 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 likened the situation this of the second intifada uh, as a, as a, like a, uh, finding your spouse cheating on you. I don't know who cheated who, but the end result is is mistrust. And I'm wondering how much, in terms of the security negotiations, the 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 Israel's uh, security concerns um, and the geography. Uh, plays a role. I, like if you look at West Bank, that would practically cut the country in, in half. Um, and if, if, you, if you don't trust your spouse, uh, that might be a very difficult sell. Yeah. Um, uh, look, um, Israel's paramount concern is security. And um, all decisions ultimately are factored through a filter of security. Um, but it gets more complicated because what, in my own experience, what I found were that oftentimes, and in negotiating with the security services, um, some of the most thoughtful and pragmatic and creative minds actually res exist and, and, and moderate uh, exist in Israel's security services. Um, this goes against the cliches and the you know, images that you would have of either people from the Shin Bed or the Mossad or, or, or the military. Uh, but in my own experience, in negotiating with elements of all of those, these are very hard-nosed people. They recognize Israel's strengths, uh, they recognize Israel's needs, and they rec but they also recognize Israel's limits. And so they have to balance, you know, that's what statescraft is about, um, is about balancing you know, your interests, your needs, and also your capabilities. Um, so yes, the fact that, you know, one of the things that makes this next phase of the peace process, concluding a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine so difficult is the fact that the West Bank is geography. The West Bank being uh, kind of along the uh, Africa, uh, Asia-Africa rift in which there's a mountain pass that basically goes all the way from Egypt into Mesopotamia that leaves the West Bank on the high ground overlooking the coastal plain that is the large population centers of Israel. And so goes the argument from the Israeli security point of view is how do we relinquish control of, the, of, of high ground um, to a Palestinian state that can then overlook and bisect and um, cut off our country out of the narrow waist of, what, nine or ten miles. Um, it's a legitimate security concern. Um, and it's a serious one. And that's why, just uh, perhaps just uh, without answering your question, but to address it in a sense, what, what Secretary of State John Kerry in this last round of negotiations did something really smart. He said, okay, you have all these baskets of concerns for final status negotiations, Jerusalem, refugees, but one of them is security. And so he tasked one of the most prominent and most impressive American generals, General Allen, to work with the Israeli security establishment and devise a package of measures to address Israeli security concerns. Now this, unfortunately, this set of, con uh, this, the, the conclusions that he drew in, in conjunction with the Israeli security services is still classified. And in fact, I've recommended to the Israel, to the American, to the National Security Council that they try to release elements of it. Because what, you know, why not try to, if your goal was to remove an argument, in essence, which is that there's no way that Israel can relinquish this territory while, protect, while protecting security, and you believe you've come up with a means to address Israel's security concerns. <laughs> then perhaps what you need to do is at least help explain how this can be done. Um, so 
it's a real problem, but, you know, uh, at least according to many in the Israeli security establishment, not an insurmountable one. From the outside looking in, we all know that the complexity and the nuance of the Israeli-Palestinian issue is uh, enormous. And I invited Rob to come here because he's been behind the curtain, and I thought, and I was right, that he could help us understand this complexity and the nuance of the politics in much more fine detail uh, from the inside to help us from the outside understand this problem. And I hope we all benefit from that. I know I did. Thank you, Rob, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Neil.